So we are at seven o'clock. We're live, are we? We're now live. Um, right. So, Mike, Gregory, uh, thank you for joining us um, with uh, for, for this webinar for the BACD. Um, it's it's fantastic that uh, you've you've given up some time. Um, just admitting a few more for more people. Uh, I think you know you can see that there's obviously some real interest in what you've got to say um, about dentures, and I know that you've been in dentistry for I think it's now 48 years, uh, 15 years I believe as a dental technician, and then you retrained as a dentist and qualified uh, for almost 30 years ago. Um, it's just so, before you or just after you? It's just before me. It was just before me. So. Um, I think now your practice is limited to dentures and um, luckily you work with me because I don't do any dentures. Um, but I think, you know, what would be really useful tonight, I think there's obviously a lot of people who have a lot of stuff. Well, there's quite, you know, quite a few people joining in. Uh, so that's brilliant. So I think if you just sort of maybe talk a little bit more about why you've developed a passion for dentures. We've had a few questions submitted, which we could kind of start the ball rolling with, and then we'll open the floor to anyone who'd like to ask Mike any questions. Um, if you'd like to ask Mike a question, either pop it in the chat or if you'd like to um, unmute yourself and make yourself visible. Um, so Mike, over to you. Tell us what, what it is about dentures that you know you enjoy. Well, I don't know what I'll enjoy about dentures. Um, I was really lucky. My training was done at the Royal London. It was only the London in those days, back in the 70s. Um, and I was taught by a, a great tutor who was a close friend of the great Chris Scully, who's sadly no longer with us. And he just inspired me. I just found it really good fun. I mean, my training was amazing. In, in the old days, when they trained technicians, uh, it took four years to get out of training. So I did three years before I qualified and another 12 months of consolidation where you did three months crown and bridge, three months ortho, three months um, chrome, just chrome, and then three months prosthetics. Um, and I just loved every single minute of every part of it, um, including the chrome and the guy was so sarcastic, but I got on really well with him in the end. Uh, he used to try and break people. He didn't manage to break me. So um, I don't know, prosthetics is just good fun. I uh, say so 15 years of that, the last eight years was, was teaching undergraduate. So I was the one of the lab instructors at UCH, so um, so qualified at London, then went to UCH, spent eight years um, showing the students how to do the lab side of stuff, and all you guys qualified. In the old days, we used to do an awful lot of lab work with students. Um, and they were the ones who made me become a dentist. They said, well, you can do this. Um, and it was hard work, but I managed to do it. So I did A-levels after work. Some of the students used to help, help me with my A-level homework. Um, then you get to dental school, and you know, as soon as I was doing prosthetics, it's just magic. Um, I don't like blood. I don't like putting stitches in people. I don't really like giving local anaesthetic that much. So prosthetics is non-invasive, generally, generally painless dentistry. So what's not to like about it? And because I was a technician, it means you can do your own lab work. The downside to that is you won't let anybody else do your own lab work for you, which can be a problem because you can take too much on. Um, but if it goes wrong, it's my fault. Um, uh, I gave up doing conventional dentistry when I tried to do a couple of AGPs this summer with Carol. She bought me all the kit and it was just so miserable that I said, I'm not doing any more of this, Carol. So <laughs> Carol, bless her, said that's fine. So I no longer do nothing bar removable. So I'm not specialist trained. Um, I've just done 48 years of dentures and, you know, I, I get by with what I've done. Maybe I could have learned more if I'd done specialist training. And when they introduced the specialist register, somebody said if I'd asked at the time, I could have probably gotten grandfather clause onto it, but it doesn't matter. So I just do, uh, enjoy what I do. So for the guys who don't know, I teach at Bristol, have taught Bristol for since 1993, so 28 years, one day a week. And I got bored during lockdown and I volunteered to do another day a week. Um, for the other reason, the fact that the students are getting so much um, or so little undergraduate teaching now, I decided to go back so I do two days a week at the University of Bristol and one day a week with Carol and it's just a brilliant happy medium. Um, I'm so sad I've converted my shed which I used to keep a motorbike in as a lab at home now so even though I've been in practice, practice all that time I've now built myself a lab at home so I can do my own lab work and look down the garden and the dog can come and see me so 
Carol's asked me to do this and it's just ask some questions on prosthetics. So um, the floor is yours, guys. I'm here to, I've got no set script tonight. I will just talk about what anybody wants to talk about at all. Um, I post quite a lot of stuff on um, Instagram. People ask me questions on there. I had some questions this afternoon. So um, if you guys want to just chip in now and ask me some questions, um, I'm here. I've got a load of, I've got my iPads plug, plugged in. I've got loads of lectures and slides on there. If I can find anything quick enough, I can show you examples of stuff if you're interested. So I don't know how many people we've got here. I'm 20, 25 people or something. So is anybody who want to start the questioning? I've got 32 participants. I'm sure, Mike. There's got to be a question in there somewhere, isn't there? There's got to be some questions here, but sometimes people are a bit shy. So there's a couple we've got already that we've had. I think, because given that this is a webinar for the BACD, what place do you think dentists have got still in cosmetic dentistry? I thought you might ask me that, Carol. <laughs> so I made some notes because I thought there's, there's a load of stuff. Um, it depends. I mean, when I was asked to do this, I thought what I like about prosthetics is, and I'm a great fan, anybody knows Finley Sutton and John Bestford, I thought about setting up an academy of Discrete dentistry, I thought would be quite nice. So, you know, you can do some people, cosmetic dentistry means different things to different people. Um, some people want straight and white. And I uh, this memorable um, quote from years ago, my one of the hygienists we used to work with, her dad used to be my patient. And he got to the point where he needed dentures. And he said, I don't want to look like one of the, um, uh, the Gib, tw Gib people uh, of the Bee Gees. So, so some people want to look like straight white teeth. And some people want the complete opposite. Um, so my take on it, prosthetics, removable prosthetics uh, with dentures, you can be so discreet, so subtle. And I'm sitting eating dinner just now. I'm thinking, I used to do quite a lot of crown and bridge work in, in one of the labs at UCH. Um, and if you're doing crown and bridge work, fix whatever, um, you've got to trust the technician to, to produce what you've written down you want. And if it comes back to the lab, it's not quite right. The angulation is not quite right. There's not enough character. You've got to send it back. And I'm sitting eating dinner tonight thinking, if you're doing prosthetics and it's, it's wax work, you can sit there and you warm your wax knife up and you start to move stuff around in front of the patient while they're sat there. You can't do that with crown and ridge work. Maybe you, 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 your technician's brilliant. They can do exactly what you want, but it's like asking somebody to paint the Mona Lisa. You can describe the Mona Lisa in great detail, if the person's never seen it, you're never gonna get anything remotely close. And there's always a risk with when we prescribe anything for, for a technician. Um, you want them to produce something and in your mind's eye, it's one thing. And in somebody's mind's eye, it's something else. With prosthetics, I just think you've got the freedom to do whatever you like within reason. I mean, I don't often do chair side adjustments to trines, but if I need to do them, like you move the center line, you change an angulation of a tooth, create a space, create some incised attrition. The whole lot is done while the patient sat there. So the adjustability of prosthetics for me is great. Um, and we've all been taught as undergraduates to move teeth around, set teeth up. So theoretically, anybody can do it. You can't do big chair side adjustments to crown and bridge. It's not what you're expecting. You've then got to try and re-describe it. It's easy nowadays with, um, graphics you can actually draw on a picture and say I want it like this I want it like that but you know with prosthetics so from my point of view that's one massive factor other things cost I mean you know costs can affect anybody no matter what we think people have budgets um, and prosthetics by comparison a lot of dentistry is cheap dentistry um, it's completely reversible which is nice I mean most most prosthetics we do I do is non-invasive reversible dentistry so you so come along, some, somebody comes along and they've got issues, they need, need some restorations, they don't know whether they want dentures or implants. The nice thing is you can do dentures, you're not doing anything irreversible, and you can say if you don't like dentures, you produ effectively produced a stent, you can have fixed work on the back of that. Um, so it's easy, it's a stepping stone. I mean, I grow, I'm a great fan of simple dentistry goes wrong in a simple way. If dentures go wrong, you're back to the beginning, you've burnt no bridges, so... I think mean, that's a great, great upside to it. What else did I write down for? Um, yeah, okay. non-invasive soft tissues. I thought, does somebody want to say something? I've got a face appeared down the bottom. I, yeah, there's some good questions coming through here, but you, you finish up and then- um... I've got one, one more thing I was going to say. Um, I look at 
loads and loads of stuff on Instagram because I know the students do. So I just think I ought to be aware of what they see. Um, some of the stuff is a work of art, but I, I think that one of the biggest downsides um, to fixed is replacing lost soft tissue. Some people are great at it, but if you lost a huge amount of soft tissue, if you're doing it with ceramics, it never convinces me. The great thing with removable prosthetics with, with acrylic work, for want of a better word, composite, you can reproduce lost tissue contour so easily and so convincingly. I mean, you, I think, and we, we don't, we're not sure if Finley Sutton's in this group, I think he is, but anybody knows Finley Sutton's work. Um, John Wibley's work, people like that, they're, they're, their gum work is just second to none. Totally convincing as a replacement for soft tissue. So that's where I think cos dentures have got a place in cosmetic dentistry. I'd love to hear anybody's views and may, may disagree. If not, I can read these questions here. Can you read the question? Can you see them? Well, if anyone yeah. wishes to join in with that thought on what Mike's saying, feel free. I'll read the first question while somebody's coming up with some questions. Would you ask the lab to do the try on the bike block or have they used to articulate the models? Um, well, asking, answering questions about lab work is tricky for me because, as I said, I won't trust anybody to do it. Um, I think if you spend time trimming your occlusal rims precisely so that it's the shape of the denture and where you want the teeth, and you trust your technician to do that, get them to set the teeth in the rim. If you're not 100% sure, or you think you may need the rim for something else, like re-recording the reg registration or something, get them to set on a fresh base plate. It doesn't matter. Um, it's down to trust. I mean, I say, I, I, my rims are gone. I don't have my rims ready uh, if anything's gone wrong, but then I'd make a rim chair side. That's the joy of being a technician all these years. I, I wouldn't bat an eye that making another occlusal rim while the patient sat in the chair if I had to do it. But yeah, getting set on the, on the base plate, uh, um, a fresh base plate, if you want to keep your rims is a good idea. I wouldn't argue with that for a minute. Um, I got given a direct message here, Mike, so there might, you might not be able to see this. I think that was slightly accidental from Gordon Matthew. Is there a strict rule for the placement of the post dam dams on a full upper? Absolutely. I don't think there are many strict rules, to be quite honest. <laughs> I think the strict rule is, if you want to know where to put the post dams, find out where it should be which is basically palpating the soft tissues. Um, you need to know, the technicians, I mean, technicians are so often asked to cut a post dam on a model, but they've got no idea, well, they've got no idea, they've got an idea where it is, but they can never be sure. So um, if you want to get it right, basically you should be palpating the soft tissues in the mouth. And if you don't want to cut the model, just draw it on the model where you want the post dam. And the other thing with post dams is make sure they're wide, rather than, than, than some make the map narrow and deep. Now, if it's too narrow and it's too far back, by the time you cut it back, because it's too far back, the patient's gagging, you've lost all your post dam. So the secret with a post dam is make it broad enough that you can afford to shave a millimeter or two off the posterior portion of it and you've still got some post dam left. Um, and the other thing to do is when you're doing your second impressions is compress the soft tissues with your special tray to sort of almost accentuate the soft tissue detail at the back. If you can see the fovea palatini, you've got a good idea of where the post dam should be. So ultimately, I don't think it's the hard and fast rules, but if you want to rule, it's actually, dentists should do it, not the technician. Unless the technician's in there with you, or it's the CDT, you should be doing it. But say, that's the only hard and fast rule. It's your responsibility, not the technician's. And if it goes wrong, you've got to take it on the chin. You can't blame them if it's not in the right place. And the other thing is, if you're worried about a patient gagging, put a couple of post dams on. And one of the big things I, I teach quite a lot of time is post dams, the patient's had a denture I'm treating the case like at the moment. And if the post dam has been there for a long time on the present denture, you'll get an indent in the palate. When you get an indent in the palate, it comes out on the model. If you say nothing and it's underextended, which is fairly common, and they're not always gaggers. If you see a post dam too far forward, don't assume the patient's a gagger, always palpate. And if they don't gag beyond where the, where the current post dam is, you can probably get away with pushing it further back, which will give you better support and better attention. Um, so just make sure it's where it should be. But if there's an indent on the, in the mouth, it'll come out on the model and the technician will, unless you tell them otherwise, assume that's where the new post dam's gonna go. So you just perpetuate the problem. The post dam's too far forward and it's forever gonna be too far forward. So. See where the post dam is an indent in the mouth. Make sure the technician knows to take it further back if that's your intention. And that's my that's my chat on post dams, which lasted way longer than people anticipate or expect. Oh, good. So, can you read the next question? That um, me to read it out. 
I've got hello, hope you're well, which presumably means I know this person. Sorry, I forget names. <laughs> That's polite. Ayana says, I um, hope you're well. I was wondering when, it, when comparing acrylic RPDs with polyamide nylon, which I presume is that the flexible horrors? <laughs> you get it. Yeah, I say it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't mix it. We don't like flexible horrors. Um, what advantage does nylon have over acrylics? Um, well, if it's the flexible dentures we're talking about, and if the person who wanted to pose the question wants to, wants to interact here, can you? Yeah, I can I'll find it. Yeah, okay it, then. Um, can I unmute the person who posed the question? No, I'm, I can't. They unmute themselves. Um, no, yes, yes. I, I'm referring to flexible uh, partial dentures. Okay. Um, I can't say much nice about them, to be quite honest. Um, I put something on. I want somebody asked me a question the other day. Was it on Instagram? Anyway, it's, um, by definition, oh no, it was on one of the forums. Uh, for dentists by dentists, I think. Um, somebody's asking about flexible dentures. We were all taught that, that partial dentures, the major connectors should be rigid. So if we were taught that, I'm guessing there's, there's some science behind that. So that shoots that out the, the, the water straight away. You can't do additions to, to um, very easily. I'm told you can do additions to flexible dentures. Um, I've had so little experience of them. Uh, patients come in, I've had one guy threw it at me. I didn't make it and said, I can't wear this. They've eased and eased and eased and I remade it with a chrome and it was fine. So um, yeah, um, we had a patient in the hospital recently and somebody signed him up for two additions because they cause quite a lot of periodontal damage if you're unlucky. This patient had a flexible denture made in, in the Philippines and their upper three was gonna fail. And one of the upper molars were failing due to perio issues. And you can't add to them. So, you know, if you, well, I'm told you can, but I mean, routinely people won't add to them unless you send it off to a specialist, which isn't going to be a quick thing. So, yeah, I'm sorry, um, you won't get much support for partial dentures made of the flexible stuff. I mean, the only thing I like about the flexible materials is that when you make the acetyl clasps, so if you make the resin colored, uh, resin clasps, beta shaded clasps, they've got a great place on occasions, but that's about where it stops. Um, Oh, somebody said Chris Chris McConnell is he is he the new um, new to be new new leader of the clan? Um, walk me through the steps. Actually, recording vertical height jaw relationships. Um, I could. Um, it's I almost need to do a presentation with this. I wasn't ready for this. Sorry. Um, first thing to first is um, I am a great fan of a Willis gauge. I talk to some dentists who've been dentists for years, and they say. I can do it by sight, which is fine and people can, but as I'm teaching undergraduates, I just think I ought to do what I teach. So a vertical face height assessment is the first thing, getting the resting face height right. And we're all told to get the patient to relax and maybe swallow. Um, that works for some people, for other people it doesn't work. So I've got three, I've got three ways of getting undergraduates to do a resting face height to get the fixed position to start with. The first thing is get them to swallow, put your Willis gauge on and, and measure the face height. Now I then get them to, to say M and hold the sound like they're humming. So if you say M and hold the sound, your lips are just together, but your teeth are apart uh, or your jaws are apart if you're a dentalist. So that's another measure. And then the last thing is get the patient to gently blow. Now with COVID, you're gonna have to stand to one side when they do this, but you get them to blow on your mirror or something. And I just purse their lips and again, measure that. So those three measurements, relax, say letter M and blow, average the three out, that's pretty good at getting resting face height. Um, and then you just subtract three millimeters. Now, if the patient presents with a centimeter of freeway space, complete dentures usually, I'll give them more freeway space than two to three mil because you know if you get it wrong, it's just awful to try and dig yourself out of a hole. So give them too much freeway space. They present with a centimeter plus. I don't mind giving them four, four, four millimeters, maybe even five if you're slightly worried. Just tell them the downsides, they might look slightly overclosed when they contact. But compared to how overclosed they will look with their present dentures with a centimetre freeway space, the, the, the difference will be significant. So that's the vertical face height. The retruded, now I don't use Gothic arch, even though lots of people say it's brilliant, I'm too old to change my ways, but I might actually get in the routine of doing this before I retire. And I've retired once already, so I might not. But I just practice getting the patient to go retruded every single time and time again before you try and record it. So the simple thing we were all taught, curl the tongue to the back of the hard soft palate junction, keep the tongue there and get them to close. 
But the thing that people get wrong is they don't hold, if you're doing a complete denture, even a partial denture, you must hold the lower rim in place when you get, guide the patient to retrude it. So you've got, I don't know if you can see my face, you've got to put your fingers on the buccal flanges of the lower, thumbs under the chin, hold the lower down, and then you can see if they're going into retruded, because you can see if the tongue deviates, but you can stop the lower rim floating up. If you don't hold the rims down, the rim will just float up a bit and they'll bite somewhere, but it won't necessarily be retruded jaw relation or centric relation as we are told to teach the students, even though I think it's a slightly confusing term. So retruded jaw relation for the non-reproducible jaw ridges. And the other one which people get wrong so much, um, is my, oh my, uh, they get so much is, is getting the patient intercuspal. Um, I try and get the patients to join in with the jaw relation vertical dimension. The patient's got tooth to tooth contact and they can feel it. We find this with the students. Patients are really nice to dentists and even nicer to students. And they say, oh, it feels fine. And they don't actually even say it. it's not the same. Fine isn't the same as correct. So I'll get the patient to bite up and down before we do anything. If they've got tooth to tooth contacts reproducible and get them to tap together and make them note what's going on. And then if it's two, two rims, I put both the rims in one at a time. And I say to the patient, I, I want you to tap up and down. If you can't feel your teeth touching, tell me, be hypercritical. I, I tell patients all the time, be really fussy. If you're not fussy, you'll come back and there'll be problems for both of us. So you're allowed to be fussy, um, allowed to be honest. So I get them to tap up and down, no rims in, put the first rim in, tap up and down, adjust it until they can feel the teeth touching. They can do that and then take that rim out if there's two arches and put the other rim in and go through the same process. So both rims in individually will allow the teeth to contact and they're a hundred percent sure the patient is, does it feel completely normal? If they say yes, take it out, bite with nothing in. Does it feel normal? Fine. Put the rim back in. Does it feel exactly the same? Quite often they say, actually it's not quite the same. So then take, heat the rim up again, cross hatch it, back in. Same with the lower. And then when you put the rims in together, if they're propped open at this point now, they're just propped open on the um, rims themselves, one rim against the other. And the patient at this point should be tuned into what you think the, they should recognize what's supposed to touch. And they should take it from there. And once you think you've got it right, take the whole lot out again, get them to contact, right? You can feel them touching one rim at a time, second rim at a time, and then close together. And if they can feel that, then um, I've got this thing against and we didn't, we were going to do this last, I did a webinar last week for the um, Mentors for Dentists. So I wanted to do a questionnaire of what the technicians really honestly think of um, these silicon bite registration materials. Um, so often that they, they've got a degree of bounce. I was talking to one of the senior technicians at Bristol a couple of Mondays ago. They don't like them much because there's a degree of spring with those silicons, which sometimes the technicians can't actually work out what height the teeth should be because there's always this degree of bounce. So I use passive. I, I'm a great fan of using either wax or preferably zinc oxide usual impression material between rims. Because when the patient closes together, they can't feel anything. So they don't deviate. They literally just close through something they can't even feel. And then the rims stick together and then you've done it. And it comes out and there's no, there's no bounce. There's nothing. It's 100% it's um, accurate in that respect if they've been in the right place. The other thing I would say, of, and I, we did this, um, we did a poll with these, these um, baby dentists, they're all qualified, they're most qualified on the same session. And I've got this um, theory and it was borne out actually that the, the norm in dentistry sadly is people take for dentures, they take primary impressions and most lab sheets are written up with trays and bites. So this is going on a bit for one answer, but somebody asked me so. Um, so trays and bites. So the lab then make occlusal rims and special trays. I'm sure nobody on here does this, but just in case you've got junior associates who do, if you do trays and bites, you've said to yourself, your second impression is going to produce a different model to your primary. Otherwise, you wouldn't be taking a second impression. If anyone wants to shout, uh, they disagree with that. But I think that's that's right. Is that if you take a primary impression, you're going to take a secondary. You've said to yourself and everybody else, these models will be different. You can't argue with that. Now, the lab have made the rims on the primaries. You're going to use the rims in the mouth and then the mouth's going to give the soft tissues will, will, will move around and the rims will fit the mouth. They're only wax anyway. But the thing is, the rims were made on the primaries when the lab go to put them on the secondaries, and you can't do this chair side because you've just taken your second impressions. 
when the lab goes, and I've seen this myself, when the lab go to put the rims that were made on the primaries on the secondary models, they're not going to fit properly because the models are different. So they then have to make the rims fit the models by chopping bits off or maybe warming them up and they sort of squeeze the rims together. And if you squeeze the rims together and skew them ever so slightly, your jaw relations changed. Now we did a poll last week and I think we had 63% of the audience and there were 140 odd dentists there said they regularly get problems with bite registrations being wrong at the first trying. So this is the first time we've ever done a survey and, and 60 plus percent and then another percentage on top of that said they regularly get problems. Some said they frequently and some said they don't often get them. So I think trays and bites are potential big massive pitfall for jaw relations. So I hope Chris that's answered the question you posed seeing about 10 minutes ago. So if it didn't, if Chris wants to shout out, I'll try again. <laughs> no, that's that's fantastically helpful. Thanks, because that's often questions that we get as well. Tra um, trays, trays and bites, I think, ask any technician. Do they just, they won't go, there's no way they'll go together. Having been a technician for 15, I know it as a fact, they won't go back together properly. So yeah, yeah. That's, I, think, I think that's a top tip, because I think many of us do, uh, as you say, the secondaries and the bite all in one go, so. Yeah, it's okay <laughs> if, if you do that, you, you pour your own model up, you can then see if the rims fit, because most dentists aren't gonna pour the models. They never see how those rims don't accurately fit the second impression cast they've got. And that's the problem. So spread the word. It's my campaign. Right. In my, in my uh, waning years of being a, a dentist stroke technician, uh, this is my campaign. Try and stop trays and bites. Great. So, Top tip. So does anyone else, before we go on some other submitted questions, have anything they'd like to ask Mike? Half an hour into this already. Yeah, exactly. Everyone's oh. very quiet. Okay. So somebody said, what are the most common mistakes? Well, that's one of them. <laughs> I think that's a big one. Uh, the other one is case assessment, getting it wrong at the beginning. Um, if you don't find out, and I drum, try and drum this into students, and we had a great example only last week, find out what the patient wants and make sure you've written down everything they want and you've read it. When I don't do this, Jess, um, Carol will testify, Jess is just amazing at just holding my hand. She does everything for me. She's been with me since... 2000 it's quite a long time isn't it um, and she writes down so I have a conversation with the patient Jess writes down the salient points which is what does the patient want from the treatment because um, if you're sitting talking to them you try to remember all this after they've left the room to write it down so if you trust your nurse to, to proceed what you've the conversation you've had get them to do it bullet point what do they want what do they expect so you can then work out whether you can deliver and we had a great example of when this went pear-shaped with one of our undergraduates at Bristol. You know what it's like an undergraduate. You've got totals. You've got to get your totals through to get signed up for finals. So fourth-year student last week got to try in stage. And luckily for me, it wasn't egg on the face. I didn't actually um, supervise this case all the way through. I came in at trying. So it's a relatively young patient who'd lost a few posterior teeth, complained of a loss of function, quite limited occlusal clearance. So... The decision sensibly on the face of it was to make a chrome because it's not going to fracture and it would be nice and thin in the palate. So what happens when the patient turns up for trying? I didn't know it was going to be metal. And all of a sudden the patient said, I don't want the treatment. So basically the poor student got four fifths of the way through the treatment plan. Denture's not going to be fitted. So if the patient student's unlucky, they won't get a credit for that. So if you don't find out what the patient wants and you've got to tell them everything that's going to happen, it can bite you on the backside right again. So if you haven't got a bullet pointed wish list, because sometimes they'll ask for things that you just cannot do right from the beginning. But that's great because you can say well, it's not doable, we can't do this. Some people don't want much at all, it's easy. So if you haven't got a wish list, you're putting your head on the block, you're waiting for things to go wrong. And things will, everybody's had things go wrong, I've had things go wrong. So that's one of the things that goes wrong, not getting a wish list. Um, uh, yeah, what else? Oh, we've got another question here, we've got a couple of questions. Um, how do you resolve the issues regarding trays and bites? Do you take a secondary and then bite? Yeah, absolutely. You have to take a second impression and then the rims are, if you've had the rims made, the lab can then adapt the rims. Sometimes we do primary registration treatment planning. If, you, if you're if you short of space, um, you need to know how much room you've got. If I can just if I can just share a case with you guys, because it's, it's quite interesting. We had one um, quite recently. Um, and this was this was on Instagram. If anybody's seen it, who's this? Oh, this guy. So I'm looking him up. I'm going to share this screen in a minute. It's a, it's a great example of a case where 
um, I'm going to find this now. A uh, case where a guy came to us, he'd had some teeth out during lockdown and he needed some dentures. Um, he'd never worn dentures before, so I'm trying to multitask here. For some reason, I can't find the presentation. So, anybody want to shout a question? I can, I can talk at the same time. I've got a submitted question here, Mike. If you're on, shout out, shout out. What tips do you have for recording a passive flabby ridge? Oh, I've got a video on that. <laughs> for some reason, you might have to talk. Yeah, for some reason, can I do flabby ridge while I'm trying to find the other one? Yeah. Yeah. Right, I've got a whole presentation on this. This is this is relatively quick. If I can share my screen. You should be able uh, to share your screen. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Right, so this is shared screen. This is a iPad. Hope it's going to talk to it. All right. Um, this is slightly different from the way most of us were taught. And, perfect. Which is no bad thing. So this is average impression technique. Okay, so this is a real case. So... This is off what I've missed. People don't don't spot this. So this is a beautiful flabby ridge. It's such a thing. Great example. This was Carol's practice. We just got lucky one day. A lady came in and said, right, Jess, get the video out. We've got to film that because not everybody's seen a flabby ridge. Um, and you can see what happens when a patient's yeah. got dental with a flabby ridge. Up and down. Get the patient to operate. It's a bit of a challenge, but yeah. the thing and just sinks. Again. So again, patient expectations. So to so patient with a flabby ridge side. don't promise too much because it's always going to move all you can do is minimize the grief it's going to give you and this is how flabby ridges arise this is another great tip if you guys want to screenshot this if anybody here makes dentures or they treat anybody or they work with anybody who makes dentures complete upper dentures opposed by lower anterior remaining teeth like three to three or four to four one is induces the flabby ridge if you show them the video you'll frighten the patients and two is if you don't make a lower denture, this is the top left picture is blind in the obvious. This is what happens. Now you hear over the years, people say, I'll just reline it, I'll remake the upper. All I say to the patients, I can guarantee you the new denture will be just as bad as the old one, unless you let us make a lower denture. And this picture I just lifted off Google. I don't know how I found it, but it wasn't difficult to find. So I show the patient this and say, look, if I make you an upper, which I don't mind doing, but I will guarantee you it will be unstable in occlusion. It will probably drop at the back and it'll move around because um, by definition they can only incise to, to actually function so the denture is going to be loose if you give them some posterior support the upper denture can't drop and people get that that's a great image um, so flabby ridge impression technique shotlander make the most beautiful edentially special trays nowadays these are way better than the solo stock trays that everybody's been bought up on they were made from the days when people had big ridges nowadays as we all know people have got flat ridges on no ridge Shotlander make these great trays and the thermoplastics you can heat them up and flatten them off even more. So that's the trade to the denture. If you don't use impression compound in doing prosthetics, I think you're missing out. People say you can use silicon. You can use silicon, but it's expensive. You can't readapt it. You've got to cut bits off. You can't add stuff to it very easily. So I'm a great fan of um, impression compound. Red or green, fine. Stock tray, don't worry about displacing the ridge, just literally shove it in the mouth. Sounds awful, but shove it in the mouth and just record the whole mouth, overextension a lot, it really doesn't matter. Then take an alginate wash in it. If you need to green stick it, and you can see on here, but it wasn't in the previous picture, green stick goes with um, um, impression compound. So I've added green stick there and usually there as well to get full sulcal depth at the back. Take an impression with alginate, then wash. Again, overextension doesn't matter, displacing the ridge doesn't matter. You just want the whole mouth. Then you pour the model. You need to get the model back realistically and show the technician where the flabby tissue is. So in the old days, we would say, and you, you guys know this, we'd have a special tray with a window in the front. They were useless, basically, I think, because that ridge, that, that, that anterior ridge here is going to almost dictate where the flabby ridge goes. So basically, don't bother. Have a win, a, 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 an opening at the front rather than the window. So we've got here a central rest so you can actually take the tray in and out the mouth. And so try the tray in the mouth, make sure you're clear of the flabby ridge. If it's not, say for instance, it's encroaching on the ridge there, just take it back. You can't do this without these. They're, these are, I don't know if I'm to plug Amazon, but I'm gonna plug Amazon. These, these cost like 14 pound for two. They go through the autoclave, you use them at work, they're just brilliant. But you need some retraction 
you probably didn't notice in the video, these have been used to, to, to film the flabby ridge, but also used to treat it. So one of the two sizes, and you can see the retractors in here, it just pushes the ridge out of the way. So trying the tray in the mouth, push the, without this retractor, you can't do it. Really difficult. Green stick I routinely use. Green stick, hard soft pallet junction. So this is a bit I was on about. And interestingly, what I said earlier on, can you see red line? See that line there? That's the old post dam region. And see, it comes out on the model, it comes out on the green stick and it's in the mouth. So you can see the tray's been made much further back here because it needed to be. So I told the technician, but I draw on the models telling them how to make the tray. So green stick, good old zinc oxide usual, you can't beat the stuff. Um, it's flowed around the ridge at the front, it doesn't matter. Remove the excess, you can do it with silicon if you like. I just like zinc oxide. So clear it from the ridge. Again, the retractor's in. Without the retractor, this is so difficult, I wouldn't even try it. I've made a video, which you'll see in a minute. So flabby ridge, completely clear of the tissues. So this is a student who volunteered to pretend she's got a flabby ridge, guys. This is the same technique for loose teeth, by the way. So my fingers in this, this image, because at Bristol we don't have these retractors, is what you do next. So you have to imagine here what you can see with the wax and the tray in the mouth is a special tray. There's a couple of still images to clear that up. So what you do here is you get some light bodied silicon and the retractor, not your fingers. And this is the light bodied silicon, light so you need to load two guns. So you, at the moment you'd be squirting light bodied silicon either around loose teeth or around the flabby ridge. So it's non-displacing. You literally just squirt the thing passively there. If you're worried, you can actually get a triple spray if you're allowed to use triple sprays and blow it into the crevices. Now you've got a second gun loaded with bite registration silicon okay. in your other in your other holster. That gives you the detail. So that comes in next. So first one's done. The retractor's not in because we haven't got it. We use now. So the first bit hasn't set. This is bite registration, like Futar D or, or Hydrobite. And this goes over the top. We've got form. You have the retractors in, none of this has displaced the ridge, it's passive. And the bite registration material will stick to the first lot of silicon if it's not set, probably stick anyway. And you just build a layer up, because you know the Futar D and the like, it's quite rigid when it's set, which is great. It's not 100% rigid, it's already covered, but it's, it's thick enough, it's rigid enough and to work for this. You squirt it around the handle, the edge of the tray. If this was an edentulous case, you'd put fix around the edge of this tray. That's what the flabby ridge impression looks like. So you can see here, the, the mint color is the light bodied silicon and the, the other green is the, is the Futar D. So basically you take the impression out of the mouth and there's your completely non-displaced flabby ridge. And it's that easy. So I think window trays are out, out. There's, no, there's no point doing them. It's, it's way harder than it needs to be. And, and that, that just shows beautifully, I think you'll agree. The old post dam, way too far forward. The, the proper post dam should be back there somewhere. So again, you've got another centimeter of denture base to support that, that wobbly denture. And just tell the patient it's going to move. Whatever you do, it's still going to move. So that's, that's Uh, I'll stop and do any right. questions. Right, shout, shout questions, people, while I try and find Jamie. I'm going to have to do Jamie a different way. Uh, well, that Jamie was is the guy bad. who was. Um, so I'll, I'll I, if anyone else right. would like to either type a question into the chat the question. or, you know, unmute yourself and come up with another question. I mean, I can, I, I have more submitted questions. Um, I've, got, I've, got, I've got the guy who's over in the summer for the vertical height thing. I'll do that now because I like, this is a good case. This is an interesting case. So this, this is Jamie. So Jamie came to us in the summer and that was his bite. Is the, so this is in no particular order, I'm afraid. I've got a better presentation than this. So that's his correct vertical face height and that's what he came as. So he's got no posterior support. So he's massively overclosed. Um, and that upper central incisor is not the best picture. There are better pictures. So that's the correct vertical dimension. So fortunately for us, he's got some vertical space so we can actually get some dentures in. So that's another great example of get, check in the vertical dimension. 
you've got to have enough room, which is why I do primary registration. So this guy had a primary registration done to make sure we had enough space. So I think the primary reg is here. So that's it mounted on an articulator. So the, I had rims made on the primary cast here, but I used them on the primary cast to mount, which is slightly against what I was saying earlier on. But that's the way to do that. So primary casts are worth mounting. Then the technician can see how much room they've got to work with. Because quite often they haven't got enough room. So that was that case. I don't think there's anything more. Oh, there's a slightly better picture. So that's the registration in the mouth. You can see and that you can see zinc oxide usual to record the bite instead of futar or hydrobite or whatever people like. People like it. I can understand why they like it. I just never used it, except for flabby ridge impressions or loose teeth impressions. So that was very brief, but that was that one. What else is I going to talk about? Oh, with lower chromes, when can you get away with a lingual bar connector and when should lingual plate be used? Well, uh, <laughs> Oliver Guy said, I'm paranoid about lingual plates because John Besford showed us a case. I don't know if you guys know, I'm in the study club with John Besford, Finley Sutton and, and 12 other people. We talk about dentures and nothing else because we're really boring. And John Besford made a, a fantastically retentive partial lower denture and the patient had three to three standing in the lower arch. And he made a lingual plate and he said the patient came back some time later, having developed either xerostomia or something went wrong. And the patient came back to him, the lingual plate, and they pre presented with him with six decoronated lower anterior teeth in a tissue. And every single teeth are decoronated through caries. And he vowed never to make another lingual plate after that because of the problems of lingual plates. So um, I don't do lingual plates anymore. So I would normally do lingual bar, if there's enough room, if there's not enough room on a sublingual bar, and if you need a lingual plate for indirect retention, I now use Kennedy bars routinely. Um, and if I could find one now, I would show you one. So does somebody want to shout another question out while I try and find a picture of indirect retention? Anyone? Any questions? Everyone's very quiet. Okay. I, I have another. I have another question that has been submitted. What do you do when the opposing teeth have over erupted? <laughs> well, you hope the patient's over closed. It's not just over eruption. But if it's over eruption, you've got to determine whether you can get, get away with. Um, if you mean over erupted to the point where it hits the opposing arch, you, you're stuck. I've made chromes with holes in before. I've over, over erupted. My wife's aunt had an over erupted lower seven, which hit her upper tuberosity, which is a free end saddle. I made a chrome with a hole in it, basically. So posterior, you can just about get away with it. Anterior, it's tricky. Um, if you're brave enough, I, I went to a lecture by Brian Miller once and he had an over erupted, was it an upper six, an over erupted point where it hit the low, there's a dentist space opposite an upper six and the upper six there over erupted the point where it hit the lower ridge. And he just stuck a resin retained bridge either side and actually just dialed the upper six straight back into the arch. But yeah, you've got a real problem. If you're limited for space, primary registration and ask your technician, can he get anything in there? It's a good question, sensible question, but I don't know if we use technicians enough to help with treatment planning, because I know, I mean, it happens all the time at the hospital. The, 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 the technicians are asked to make stuff that's just never gonna work. But technician can tell you that straight away. If you, if you sent them two study models and they don't know what the bite is, because you haven't done the bite stage yet, um, they can only guess. But if you send a primary registration, say mount the primary cast for me, um, and I think there's a case to be said for trying to get technicians to use these plasterless articulators, the ones they super glue on for crowns, to mount primary casts for prosthetics treatment planning and then send them back. Mm. And they think to work quite well. And then you can just, you can just plan your, plan your um, denture case um, and send it back or say to the technician, I want to do this, can we do this? And they're going to tell you whether you can do it or not. Um, or well, they should tell you that if they won't. But yeah, generally I'd say, ask your technician in short space, mount your primary car, send a technician say, what can we get in here? Do you need to me to create space for you? Um, but it's tricky, over, over erupted teeth are a real nightmare. You just gotta hope over eruption has gone with a degree of overclosure because they've lost so many posterior teeth. Um, so I'm gonna try and find something on um, chromes now, um, which I've got somewhere, so. So there was a question about um, how do you take an impression with patients who have got very, very mobile teeth? And I, I think you maybe answered that with how you take the impression for flabby ridges. I did. If anybody wants to see it again, I'll quite be sure. 
Yeah, I've got, I've got. Um, all right, okay, so this is, this is how, oh, this is an interesting case. This is, well, this is why you don't make lingual plates. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a screen now. This is a presentation the undergraduates get. Um, I'll go through it fairly quickly because you guys know what you're talking about and undergraduates, some of them really good at the moment, I have to say. So this is, I don't know why we call it indirect change. I think it's massively misleading for undergraduates. It's anti-rotation. So I just wrote this for, for undergraduates. So I just whizzed through it. It's axis rotation, Kennedy class one and twos. So the, the, the least worn dentures you can make for anybody, I'm sure we'll all agree. Kennedy class one lower. Patients hate them and we hate making them because they're unreliable. Um, uh, patients don't like them and we get no satisfaction from making them unless you plan them. So, and this is, this isn't, this isn't the case John Best would describe, but this is just like it. So somebody in the study club sent me this picture. I said, send me some prosthetics horrors. And this was one of them. This is a lingual plate, obviously covering up um, gingival margins and the patient's got subgingival caries. They lost four of those seven teeth as a result of a lingual plate. I'm guessing they wore the denture too much. The hygiene's not great. Their diet's probably not great, but is it just their fault? And I don't think it is. So they're horrible. That's what goes wrong with indirect retention, which is why lingual bar doesn't work. I've pinched that picture from, um, who's it? Bass from Davenport, the BDA book, because it's a great illustration of what goes wrong. Um, we don't need that, we don't need that. Um, so this, this was a great case. Um, so this patient had some dubious dentistry done. They had two post-retained crowns on their lower fours and somebody rather heroically or foolishly made two cantilever post-retained precision attachment bridges hanging off the back of those lower fours. So not surprisingly, both the fours split and both the fours were lost. So we've now got three to three and the patient needs a denture. So this is, this is covering the, the, the lingual bar story. So these are really difficult to make. Patient's tolerance is dreadful. So what you've got to do is give them support so the dentures don't slide down the lingual aspect. If you just put support on the back of the singular, those low incisors, the dentures just drift south because there's nothing to stop them. You need to make some buttresses out of composite. I think the next picture shows a slightly bigger version of it. And then you make a chrome that sits on top. And people say, well, that's not the three millimeter rule because we get, we get obsessed with the three millimeter rule. I don't care about three millimeter rule, millimeter rule personally. I mean, that's probably a millimeter at the most, but so what? It's gingerly free, it's gonna be healthier. So basically I'd still use a lingual bar if you've got enough room. Always do Kennedy bars. This case, the patient had a diastema here, so I just split the Kennedy bar. These are the acetyl class, which I've said about. Uh, tooth shaded are virtually invisible, unless the patient likes turmeric, in which case they'll go orange in the space of two weeks and then look dreadful. So the acetyl class or the acetyl uh, injection molded um, material is great for clasps and very little else. So I don't know if that answers the question. I don't know if there's any more on this one or not. So no, it's not. Unless it shows you, no, it doesn't. Okay, so that's, um, try not to do ling lingual plates full stop. Um, if you're making acrylic dentures, you're really gonna struggle. There's really no way out of that, but um, yeah. Um, so I, I think, think that answers another question. You'd you seem to prefer chrome pretty much, so long as the patient's happy with chrome, you'd do chrome every time? Um, well, the trouble if you do acrylic dentures, I think the aim of partial denture design should be to try and get support every single time. And if you don't get support, dentures sink south. Um, and if it starts sinking, it just causes so much um, damage to periodontal tissue. So you need to put rests on dentures and you can't really put rests on acrylic dentures very easily. So ultimately I will only make acrylic dentures as a transitional and you anticipate lots of additions in the near future or it's an immediate. I had a guy recently at a practice carrier wanted a chrome immediate denture. I said, it's a complete waste of money. We're going to remake it in six months. And I talked him out of spending more money than he needed to, but he had an upper chrome and he wanted a lower chrome because they're comfortable. So yeah, try, try to do acrylic dentures as a last resort or a transition to, to um, completes or additions. I think half the problem we get is we're, and this happens at the hospital, the, the students are told you can't make a chrome until the patient's periodontal status improves. But half the time, horrible gum stripping dentures just make it worse anyway. So you, you won't get it, you won't improve matters until you actually improve the denture hygiene or denture design. So that so the tissues are, are recovering more. So the case I just showed you, the lingual caries, 
You may say that's lousy plant control, but if the patient had a denture that's gonna partly self-cleanse the tongue would have wiped those teeth cleaner than they are. So um, yeah, I, if you can't get support, now you're not gonna get support on a lower without rest, full stop, because there's not a big enough denture bearing area. On the upper, if you use enough of the palate, which is why I don't like doing um, horseshoe dentures very often, and don't do ring connectors on anything with a free end saddle, because you need the palate for support, then you can get away with it. But otherwise, yeah. Um, have we got some stuff here on the downsides of support? Um, I had some images of, of what oh, this, this is. I've got some, a couple of great pictures of. While you're looking, I'm going to ask you another question. How would you manage a patient who has a severe gag reflex? <laughs> um, I don't know if I've got lucky. I seem to manage them. What you tend to find is that patients sit with their legs crossed in the chair. So the first thing I do, I know there's other ways of doing this. Some people use acupuncture, all sorts of stuff, but I, I do this, it generally works. I get the patient to uncross their legs. So if you, if you think they're a gagger, you can find this out as soon as you examine the mouth. Get them to uncross their legs, because I don't know if you've ever noticed, I hadn't, but patients sit with legs crossed. So get them to uncross their legs, and as soon as they start to gag, I get them to raise their legs up. And the more they feel like gagging, just raise your legs higher. And it's a proper abs workout. And if mo most, nine times out of 10, that's enough to stop them gagging because they just have to focus so hard on trying to get their feet up off the chair. It's such hard work on the abs that they actually forget to gag. So most of the case, I get away with that. That's for impressions and you know, generally it works. Um, if you've got a gagger and you're making a denture in the upper arch and they've got an underextended upper and you want to go further back, this is where you do multiple post abs. So from a treatment point of view, just get them to uncross their legs. Is what I do. I don't use acupuncture. I don't um, rub the temples anymore. I don't get them to hold a bag of sugar or a bag of alginate in each hand. I just get them to uncross their legs and raise them up. And maybe I've been lucky late in the last few years now. I've known somebody's had a problem. So that's how I get around that. Um, I was just going to show you that. The what about if they said, oh, I've got a gag reflex. I can't tolerate a denture. And it, have you ever really found that someone's gag reflex is so bad that they can't tolerate a denture? I've had some say they that they will be like that and they've they've left the surgery wearing them but we've got one at the moment who you saw which is quite spectacularly um, <laughs> challenging and I sent him home with stock trays because I went near him and he started to gag so he's gone home with stock trays to try them at home and he's got to sit in front of the tv and and try a tray in his mouth he's okay with the lower it's his upper is an issue and then basically I said you know if you can't do that I said you know Stick the tr I'm, a, I'm a dreadful gagger. If I take impressions of myself, so I don't trust anybody else to do it because I'll throw up in front of them. I take an hour of myself. I'll walk around the building while it's just to take my mind off it. So I said to this guy, stand on one leg. So if you if you think you've got a real problem, send them home with some trays and get them to practice so they can actually cope under the, because quite often it's because they're out of control. So if we're vaguely in control, they're, they're better off that way. So, but yeah, I've not, I've not had one yet, but this might be the first one, Carl. That guy you sent me, he may be the first case we don't treat. I keep you posted. He'd be on Instagram if we treat him because his wear patterns are spectacular, aren't they? Yeah. I've never seen anything quite like it. So. <laughs> yeah, so I, he, he will I'm be glad I'm very glad I'm not doing that one, that's for sure. Well, um, I'd not be either. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I suppose the message there, Mike, is you can't win them all, but... Um, you can't, you can't. I mean, if this is to do the wish list, find out what they want. And if they want something you can't do, you know, you know to do yeah. it. He's, he's a lovely chap and it'd be nice if we could help him. Um, so anybody based on what Mike's been sort of talking about just now, got any, cause he, you know, we're five minutes to the hour. Um, anybody who's on the call. Can I give somebody a tip? This is, this is, you got any more questions? Any questions? Right, I, I'm going to force, the, I'm going to force this on everybody cause this is one of the best tips I was ever given. Um, how to deal with um, fit surface pain. Somebody's internet's unstable, uh, whatever. Um, bit of surface pain. Um, I was given this tip a few years ago and it's just transformed the way I do almost every stage of, of, of um, prosthetics now. So patients come in, say Kennedy class one lower, patients dig, digging in somewhere on the lingual aspect and your know, heart sinks because they're gonna come back and back. First thing you've got to do is check the occlusion. So the occlusion quite often, as I said right at the beginning when we did this, this conversation about jaw relationship, the jaw edge is wrong. 
the patients will come back and they say the denture is digging in somewhere, but nine times out of 10, it's digging in because the occlusion is incorrect. So this was a hospital case. So a patient came in, pain on the right side. So they got to check the occlusion first. This patient had tooth to tooth contact. So when we established the tooth to tooth contact was right and the vertical dimension was right and the patient wasn't propped open any longer and the patient still says it hurts, then you're allowed to touch the fit surface if you're a student. So where do you trim the fit surface? And how do you know where to trim the fit surface? So pressure indicator paste, I, I used it once when I was a student. I thought it was such a messy and imprecise material. I've never used it since. So I use this now. This just makes life so much easier. Light body silicon, the cheapest silicon you can buy, by the way, guys. It doesn't need to be expensive. This is expensive. The hospital's only got expensive stuff. Goodness knows why. So where the patient says they've got pain, put some silicon in the fit surface, no adhesive. Seat the denture, get the patient to swallow, drink water, occlude, chew around, do everything they would do, then take it out of the mouth. Now you're all going to sit there and thinking, whoa, well, unless everybody knows this tip. I didn't know it. I never told this tip, it's a great idea. So this patient now has got an area here where there's no silicon. Now you see the previous slide, there was loads of silicon in that ridge. So basically the silicon has been displaced by the fact that the denture base is digging in. So you can see here, we've got a lovely bead of silicon here and all along here. So the denture base is, is okay there. There's enough room for silicon to flow around the periphery so it can't be digging in. So that's precisely the place we need to trim it. And you can trim it through the silicon. Now I think if you do that pressure indicator paste, you're probably better at it than me. You, you, may, you may get a result, but this is so reliable time after time. This is all I do now, but you've got to check the fit surface first. And another view, you can see we need to trim this now. You're gonna to have to cut this back here just a little bit try it back in the mouth um, and then see what it's like. And then do a second wash of silicon. Maybe. Now this is the second wash of silicon. You now see we've got silicon along here, so it's closer. All we did was a trim a little bit more off there. Bingo. No, and the look on the patient's face is so satisfying. Um, and that's how you do now, uppers. I had a patient not so long ago who said they had pain on opening. I'm thinking, what's that all about? Same process. You know, they open the mouth too wide. The coronary process was brushing against the buccal flange somewhere. So this was the same, different patient. So basically here you can see exactly what's happening. The buckle flange is too wide here. So basically trim a bit off, another silicon wash, no show through, no pain, patient was chuffed to bits. And so was I, because you're not taking it off the wrong place. So that's one of the best tips I was ever given. So I had to share that with you. Sorry if you don't like it, but I'm, I'm imagining anybody who sees that are gonna think it's so easy, so simple, so cheap. Do the same with your special trays. If you want to check special tray over extension, you can do exactly the same. Put light body silicon in the tray, seat the tray in the mouth, do all your border molding, take it out. If the tray is poking through or your green sticks poking through or whatever you've modified your tray with is poking through, it's probably overextended. Trim it back a bit, do it again. It's way cheaper than doing multiple repair uh, re reviews. I know silicon is quite expensive, but we use the cheapest stuff we can buy and it's perfectly adequate for that. So the, the problems I get with lowers now, since I've adopted that technique, have just gone through the floor. It's so much easier. It's 7.58, so there we go. Brilliant, well, Mike, thank you so much. I think there've been some brilliant tips, some uh, brilliant ideas and techniques there. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. No um, I hope that the, uh, the, the people on the call tonight have, have, I'm sure had a huge amount of benefit from that. So thank you, uh, I'm actually, truly grateful that you're in my practice making dentures um, <laughs> only because you don't want to do them never have. I'm, I'm joking um, i'm joking but, you know thank you so much and um you know pleasure brilliant, brilliant um session and um that's it take care if anybody's got any questions they can they can they can contact me through instagram um, i'm sure they can find me on there um Absolutely. i don't mind asking questions i can send send examples whatever Absolutely. I mean, if anybody wants to just get in contact with me, I can give you Mike's details. Um, and um, so thanks, Mike. Have a good evening. OK. Take care. Cheers, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye, Bye. everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.